Thank you for joining us today for this study entitled Examining the Philippines' Public Investment and Bottom-Up Approach to Disaster Risk Reduction and Management. I am RV Manihar and I will be um, tackling the first part of this study from rationality until some parts of the public investment. And then I will turn you over to Dr. Domingo for the rest of the results and key insights. So as a background, um, we, must, uh, we must be aware that the Philippines lies on the typhoon belt. So on, on a yearly average, around 20 um, tropical cyclones enter the Philippine area of responsibility. Mostly hit, as seen in the graph below, is the agricultural sector, where farmers and fisher folks have a poverty incidence of 31.6 and 26.2% respectively the highest among all basic sectors. It is also important that uh, we lay the foundations for bottom-up approach and community-based disaster risk management before we um, pursue the rest of the presentation. So when we talk of bottom-up approach and community-based, the first thing that comes to mind is the participation of the public and the people. Across literature, community-based disaster risk reduction and management is described as um, having communities engaged in identification, analysis, treatment, monitoring, and evaluation. The people are involved in decision making and implementation. And um, there is involvement of the vulnerable groups, mostly by, um, most especially by vulnerable groups. And this is important for community governance because um, when they are actively participating, communities feel a sense of ownership, commitment, and accountability in these initiatives. And um, in one study, EcoWeb has this framework called Human Ecosystems Development, wherein they state if multifaceted root causes are not addressed together, then the vulnerabilities will continue and challenges will only compound. For this study, our main objective is to review the policy, institutional, and public investment aspects of DRRM in the Philippines and how they encourage bottom-up and participatory approaches. <clears throat> so specifically, we looked at policy and institutional frameworks, and then um, we backmapped um, budget and expenditure at the national and subnational levels, and then we assessed how, how this public investment um, how this public investment are allocated and utilized and how they inform policy priorities. And then uh, we recommend ways to address these gaps. For our methodology, uh, we used a three-pronged approach um, using those three main aspects aforementioned in the objectives. And for mixed methods approach, we have a quantitative data from the DILG's full disclosure portal. So we encoded the LGU submissions for the RRM reports there. And then um, we triangulated this with, um, with KIIs and FGDs with our agencies and key experts and other stakeholders. For the first part of our results, we will be talking about policy. So in the global landscape, there have been a series of paradigm shifts. And um, it started from being reactionary, and then it eventually evolved to proactivity, covering long-term rehabilitation, sustainable development, poverty reduction, and good governance. And we're seeing that in the international agreements that Philippines is a part of and also our national climate policies. We, and we also have our SDGs. And um, our A10121 or the Philippine DRRM Act retained centralized mechanisms but mostly devolved its local functions. And our, and our A7160 or the local government code supports this devolution. So LGUs can utilize up to 5% of their estimated revenue from regular sources during calamities. So our A10121 is the primary anchor of um, DRRM in the Philippines. And it has four pillars, 
Prevention and Mitigation, Preparedness, Response, Rehabilitation, and Recovery. And in representation, um, the policy requires that there should be a multi-stakeholder council and that consultation should be present in crafting plans. There is also um, issuances that requires horizontal integration, which means local plans, DRRM plans, should be streamlined or included in development plans. So in 2013, as mentioned by um, President Orbeta earlier, um, there is a joint memorandum circular among um, NDREMC, DILG, and DP, DBM, which details the allocation and utilization guidelines of local DRM fund. In 2014, DILG issued a memorandum circular, which requires mainstreaming of disaster risks and climate change in local development plans. That's why we have now um, local DRRM plans and local climate change action plans. And they are um, they are required to include it in their in their comprehensive land use and comprehensive development plans. Other avenues for participation are mentioned in the Philippine Development Plan, in the Strategic National Plan, Yogo Framework for Action, Sunday Framework, and Paris Agreement. Okay, so this slide just shows you um, the ideal. Um, ideal alignment of plans from the LGU to the provincial and national. So um, below the um, CDP should be the um, barangay development plans. And barangays are also required to create barangay DRRM plans. So in the budget process, where is the public participation? Um, barangays actually can suggest um, a series of programs, projects, and activities during consultation, and proposals are consolidated for budget hearing by the Sangguniang Bayan. And um, LDREMO, or the local DRM office, can also propose DRR-related PPAs. And it is up to the LGU whether they would um, take up these um, this suggestions and um, include them in their um, annual investment plan. However, the local chief executive or our mayors can influence the direction of their priorities because of their executive legislative agenda. So um, overall, there is a need to look at the, at the alignment of development plans across levels and their respective uh, annual investment programs. So here we have the structure for NDREMC. Um, and there are four CSOs and one private organization required. This major structure should be ideally structurally replicated in the subnational levels. However, these pillars do not have equivalent departments beyond the regional level. So at the municipal or the city level, some LGUs identify stand-ins. So, minsan po yung um, MDREM O nila or yung um, local DRM officer ay yung MENRO or minsan yung municipal planning officer nila. So, um, so this um, structures show that hindi talaga nare-replicate yung four pillars beyond the regional level. So what are the existing um, climate change and DRR investments in the Philippines? What are our possible sources? Oh, so in the national level, we have the National DRM Fund, which is a lump sum appropriation under GAA intended for relief and rehabilitation. And then we have the local DRR, LDREAM F, which, um, which should not be less than 5% of estimated revenue from regular sources. And then People Survival Fund, which is mandated by the Climate Change Act. So it's an annual fund that can be applied for by LGUs uh, and CSOs and people's organizations. And then we have the Official Development Assistance, which are loans or grants that promote um, sustainable development and socioeconomic welfare. So this is just a breakdown of definitions and um, percentages. So particularly for LDREAM F, that 5% is further divided into 70% and 30%. Now 70% is the mitigation fund, 
and 30% is what we call as quick response fund. Quick response fund can only be availed or it can only be utilized once an LGU is declared under a state of calamity. If, um, if hindi siya na suspend, napupunta yung um, the rest of the QRF into a special trust fund for the next five years. And if there are still unexpended funds from the um, special trust fund, then it will revert into the general fund, which the LGU can use for non-DRRM projects. So in some LGUs, which have very limited ERA, they tap the 20% local development fund to support their DRM projects. So here we're seeing um, a tagging mechanism by the Climate Change Commission called CSEP. So climate change expenditure tagging. So they are tracking investment, climate change investment in the national programs, activities, and projects. And leading this is DPWH. And most of this are tagged as adaptation projects. This is followed by DA and um, DNR. So as you can see here, um, there is um, heavy um, allocations for adaptation. So um, actually um, priority varies according to agency. And when we look at um, annual budget proposals, sustainable energy PPAs are mostly proposed within the national expenditure program. However, um, GAA reorients towards water sufficiency strategy. So they authorize more funding towards water sufficiency strategies. So in GAA, um, authorized budget gears more towards adaptation, reducing proposed mitigation allocations across the years. So for ODA profile, 75.30% of it is um, related to DRR projects. Our biggest funders are JICA, France, World Bank, and G GF, and DPWH, and Department of Transportation are the recipients of these other loans or grants. And these projects are mostly tagged as DRR. DA follows third with the highest climate change adaptation investment, while the Department of Energy has the highest climate change mitigation on the other hand. So now I will turn you over to Dr. Domingo for the um, for the other um, fund sources. Okay. Um, thank you, Arvi, for the presentation of the initial slides. So Ms. Manihara was able to present to you avenues wherein we have uh, stakeholder participation. So from the region, province, city, municipal and barangay levels, we have supposedly structures within the bureaucracy for the community or other stakeholders to actually get involved in terms of looking at the RRM initiatives as well as decision-making, uh, engage in decision-making processes. But as also mentioned, uh, in terms of manifested participation from our stakeholders, we have very limited evidence uh, that, we have, that we were able to see. She was also able to present uh, sources of funding for climate change and disaster risk reduction management initiatives, both from the national and subnational levels. And uh, I will be continuing in terms of uh, presenting more details now in terms of our national disaster risk reduction management fund, as well as the local DRRM fund that we have subnational. So you have on your screen the public investment through our calamity fund. This is, as mentioned earlier, lump sum allocation every year through GAA, wherein we are given a very huge uh, amount for disaster relief, rehab, and related initiatives down the ground. What you have here are two versions of uh, the allocations. To your left is the monetary uh, allocation every year. To your right are adjusted figures because every year we have insertions in terms of priority spending. For example, we had before uh, Yolanda rehab funds inserted in our national DRR fund. Uh, in recent years, we also have funding for Marawi rehabilitation. 
Now we have a more detailed discussion probably coming from OCD later on because they have uh, a recent paper detailing uh, the utilization of the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Fund. So watch out for that. So this is what you have in terms of our investment National DRRM Fund uh, over uh, several years now from 2009 to 2021. As you can see, uh, seem to, to increase over the initial years and then plateau uh, in recent years. What you have for 2022 is also around 20 billion of funding uh, with 1 billion allocated for uh, Marawi rehabilitation. And that is the next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, as I've mentioned, uh, the previous slide was able to show uh, the National DRM Fund from 2009 to 2021. This is your breakdown for 2022, wherein you have 1 billion for Maravik uh, rehabilitation for a total of 20 billion. What's uh, seemingly different is that we have more allocation QRF wise you know, in terms of our quick response fund to, deep, uh, to the Department of Education uh, in the amount of 2 billion for the year. Um, as mentioned also earlier, such can be replenished uh, once you have uh, utilized a substantial portion of the figures presented. So you have DEPED, you have DSWD, you have DA, you have DPWH as the main recipients of the big amounts coming from our QRF fund. Next slide, are we? So institution-wise, uh, in aggregate from 2009 to 2020, you have here uh, DSWD as the main as the major uh, recipient of our uh, QRF allocations, followed by DEPED, and then uh, of course DA and DPWH. For uh, DSWD to receive such is very intuitive because they are uh, actually manning response operations and relief operations post uh, during and post. Uh, disaster events. So they require so much in terms of material input, both in terms of them pre-positioning and them reacting uh, upon uh, us encountering disaster events. Next slide, Marvin. Okay, so that was your national DRM fund. Now we look at details in terms of the local disaster risk reduction management fund. This is not uh, as straightforward as our presentation uh, in the previous slides because we found it very difficult to actually look, to actually look at. There is no uh, summarized version of LGU reports you know, detailing, for example, their utilization of the 5% from their uh, useful revenues, regular revenue for DRRM related initiatives. So we had to actually back map uh, for five years, looking at reports submitted by the LGUs to the DILG uh, full disclosure portal. So this is a very indirect way for us to come up with evidence in terms of local government spending on disaster risk reduction and management. It took us almost a year to actually come up uh, with the data set you know, from recoded uh, reports coming from our LGUs. And in many cases, we had issues in terms of number one, uh, consistency in the reports. Some of them uh, have submitted quarterly reports, which eventually did not total uh, to an exact amount. So we had issues in terms of the standard of reporting uh, coming from, uh, from our LGUs. But then again, uh, the full disclosure portal of the ILG was very useful in terms of us actually getting evidences of LGU spending. Uh, a caveat in terms of us going through the next slides is, well, we did the study in 2020 prior to the onset of uh, the pandemic. And therefore, those reflected in the succeeding slides do not account for our spending on COVID-related uh, engagements. Next slide, Ollie. So looking at the total allocation in millions by fund source from 2015 to 2019, we have it here, okay? QRF 
your litigation fund within our LGUs. So the two comprise the 5% uh, annual allocation from the regular sources of revenue. And then you have downloaded uh, resources coming from the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Fund. And uh, we also have sources coming from other LTUs, donations from their neighboring uh, LTUs and from other sources. So if you're going to total such, you'll find that uh, the actual figure indicated in the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Fund over the years are higher compared to the aggregate total from our local disaster risk reduction management funds subnationally. But uh, if you're going to look at the adjusted figures, from the National uh, Disaster Risk Reduction Management Fund and compare that to what you have in this slide, we actually have more allocations com coming from the LGUs, from the 5% uh, Local Disaster Risk Reduction Management Fund. So total utilization in the second uh, table, you have their presented uh, utilization per fund source. And it's evident that if you're going to compare the first and second tables, utilization rates are very low. No? Not really reaching 100%. Except in 2018, when you're looking at uh, funds coming from the other LGs. So you have here uh, probably 100% utilization for funds coming from other LGs. More than actually in terms of actual number, because you are looking at aggregate spending from sources from the previous years. Next slide, Ernie. So you have here the graph in terms of utilization rates by fund source, QRF, litigation fund, the National Disaster Risk Reduction Management Fund as downloaded, funds coming from other LTUs as donated, and also sources from other entities giving to the LGUs. It's very evident that, uh, well, we have some optimal utilization of subnational funds. And although supposedly we have that huge resource to, to tap for local DRR related initiatives, uh, we have seen suboptimal usage of such resource. And this is something that we can uh, really augment you know, in terms of the bureaucratic capacity subnationally for them to make use of such pieces in the current. Next slide, Harvey. We, you have here a presentation of the utilization rates by region and uh, the story is also consistent. If you are looking at the orange uh, or peach color uh, bar, the utilization rate really is, is very low. You know? And it's consistent uh, from the, the richest region, which is NCR, to the poorest, which is uh, ERMF. So you, you have here uh, really a scenario where we can do a lot in terms of us benefiting with current resources already in the hands of our local governments. And such is ironic because we have been hearing a lot of uh, anecdotal evidences saying that we need to infuse more resources down the line. And if our bureaucracy subnationally is unable to actually make use of such resources, then we have a problem. Next slide, are we? So you have here as well the average local disaster risk reduction management fund allocation by region. Of course, you have the highest in the national capital region. Uh, and then down the line, you have uh, differences in terms of the actual resource, essentially based on what they have revenue-wise within the LGUs. Next slide, Harvey. So there enters the, um, the talk about inequities no? when it comes to the availability of resource for disaster risk reduction and management. Because essentially, if you're going to just look at the 5% local disaster risk, risk reduction management fund, then your poorer uh, municipalities or localities have much less compared to your richer municipalities or cities. In this slide, you have the various DRR and fund sources, yearly average 
in millions. No? Accounted for is the 70% mitigation fund. Uh, in the left, in the middle, is a 30% quick response fund. And then your total for the local DRR fund for all regions. So in the graph, you are shown as well the gap in terms of utilization and available funding, supposedly for LGUs. Next slide, are we? Now, this is the special trust fund where unutilized funding every year for the RRM reverts to. And uh, the policy is uh, this is available for five years before reverting to a common social fund, you know, which is more flexible. And a lot of our LGUs have been using uh, the special trust fund essentially to, to park their DRM funding for a more flexible uh, usage eventually in the near future. That may be intuitive on, on their part you know, because uh, they may have other sources of funding, but um, well, it uh, negates the, the presence of resources for the RRM. Uh, in the current year, no? if they're not going to use that for current concerns. So it's the same for the National DRM Fund as downloaded to our LGUs. Next slide, Harvey. So more graphs on the various DRM fund sources. Yearly average in millions from 2015 to 2019. You have on top, upper left, your executive development fund, upper right, Transfers from other sources, including other LGUs. Lower left, transfers within LGU. And then international sources uh, in your lower right. So again, the story holds that uh, there is suboptimal utilization of such funding. Highest utilization is uh, in the international sources of funding. You know? Probably because they are prompted to use this, uh, given uh, accounting and auditing requirements. Next slide, Arvi. So you have in this slide pie charts indicating the spending patterns, uh, taking note of what our LGUs have subnationally, resource-wise, and the top 10 expenditure items uh, where they place their uh, local DRR funding in, into. So in terms of spending patterns, there is more investment on infrastructure. And then in terms of expenditure items, equipment predominance. And uh, of course, there are spending also in terms of capital outlay, on evacuation centers. Uh, you have spending on food supplies for relief. And then uh, you have other items as indicated here. So what we see really is LGUs, well, it's, it's a landscape wherein LGUs are given uh, the free hand in terms of them using what's available uh, within their, L within their uh, coffers, no? DRRM-wise. And they have different priorities. But uh, also they have consistencies in terms of what they want augmented resource-wise or asset-wise. And in this case, they want more equipment. And really, they want investment in terms of... Uh, concrete items, including the much usable evacuation centers required subnationally, not only uh, per province, but, but also per city and uh, municipality. Next slide, Ari. Okay, so just to summarize the challenges, now, you are presented here the factors influencing subnational DRM. Uh, resource usage, number and probably the RM related initiatives. Number one, uh, starting from the upper left, you have your non-institutionalization of the local disaster risk reduction management office. In some cases, you have the absence of um, plantilla positions for uh, the local DRR officer, uh, absence of uh, a well-crafted local DRM plan, as well as uh, presence of capacitated staff. There are issues about them also looking at security of tenure because every three, every three years, some in some municipalities where they have changes in terms of local leadership, 
we also have changes in terms of PR and office leadership. Delays in planning and budgeting, which impacts a lot in terms of the barangays uh, coming into the picture and contributing to the overall planning process. And also them inputting the requirements uh, for the year budget ones. Misuse and discharge of funds is probably is the main reason why LGUs are not really enthusiastic in terms of uh, using and liquidating their local disaster risk reduction management funds. Failure to transfer unexpended funds to the special trust fund every year. Uh, by doing so, you have a very chaotic accounting of funding for the RM for several years. Arbitrary reporting as well. Um, as mentioned earlier, we actually benefited from the LGU submitting reports although not in a very standard way, to the DILG uh, full disclosure portal. And then silent representation in terms of uh, the presence of uh, the public in, in the platform for, for representation uh, in different levels, you know, from the barangay, municipal, city, province, and regional levels, as well as, of course, the, the national level, where you have the NTMC supposedly with uh, representations from CSOs. Next slide, Ali. Okay, so I'm in my last three slides where we present key insights and ways forward. First one, the DRM landscape still largely top down, as we have seen uh, from evidences. Uh, there is limited com community participation that is visible, and that which is visible is just through CSO representation. The Barangay uh, DRMM plan and probably the Barangay development plans are not really optimally being used by our cities and municipalities in terms of their uh, crafting their own CTPs and CLEPs. Such also highlights the entry point for private sector initiatives and also uh, contribution in terms of uh, such planning processes. There appears to be very minimal investment on participatory related PPAs. We try to score Nagaa every year for the past 10 years and uh, it's quite difficult to actually see uh, very specific allocations for uh, participatory related initiatives, PPA wise. There is inequitable resource distribution uh, among LGUs, as mentioned earlier, if you have 5% of their um, re revenues as source for the RRM funding, then it's intuitive that you see inequalities now, in terms of the presence of resources uh, for each LGUs, as also differentiated by their different classes. There is suboptimal DRM fund utilization among LGUs, so regardless, as to whether an LGU is rich or poor or classified differently, there is the consistent evidence that there is optimal, well, suboptimal utilization of what is available, what is available to them, DRM fund wise. Next slide, Ivy. National policy and international accords dictate bottom up participation but implementation processes remain ambiguous or even difficult. There is, ev uh, there is dependence on institutional leadership and spending in terms of grounding VR initiatives, both for national government agencies and LGUs. So you go to the LGUs and you see our local ch chief executives with uh, sort of dominance in terms of coming up with the, with the final uh, construct of their annual budgets. You know? And uh, we need to balance that out in terms of us inputting more coming from priorities uh, as indicated in their uh, investment programs, medium term as well as for the annual investment program submitted coming from the planning documents. The DILG's uh, full disclosure portal is a good platform for transparency and validation. But 
there has to be appropriate standards in place. Um, well, just recently, they have actually upgraded uh, that platform. And now there is more standard in terms of the submissions coming from our local governments. And that's very much welcome. But we can uh, go another level uh, in terms of us coming up with better reports from our local governments and them actually possibly reporting more on the related uh, events and initiatives. Clear use of funds and reporting is needed. The separation for unexpended balances into trust fund and its use within and beyond five years need to be cleared as well. So accounts for donations should be maintained to ensure transparency and also ease of audit on the part of the national government. And of course, on the part of COA. Next slide. Our last slide. In terms of ways forward, we have to capacitate LTUs on the RR policy and fiscal management. So as evidenced by the suboptimal use of what's available to them, we need to empower them in terms of using uh, what's current in terms of assets and resources. And not really waiting for so many years uh, to capitalize on them. Strengthen institutional avenues for community stakeholder participation, including, of course, our business community representation. Implement more participatory TPAs and be very explicit in terms of allocating resources to such. Enhance inclusion of your barangay development plans in our municipal and city level planning processes. Many cases, uh, our barangay inputs are sort of uh, neglected or not even the much needed space in terms of our upper level planning. And of course, investment programming. Institute stronger monitoring and evaluation system for plans, uh, including your programs, projects, and activities. And of course, the need for us to really tag DRR-related funding and expenditure. And lastly, we need to enhance reporting and, trans and transparency platforms. And possibly uh, us comparing our local governments to come up with yearly reports on disaster-related initiatives and even events so in terms of the impacts of disasters in their communities. So that is the last uh, slide, I think. Harvey, uh, can you... So we just have uh, our, our, our thanks to give to you. And this is last slide. We look forward to the open discussion later. Thank you.